company were here so two years, years, not year, but a class two years ago. Yep. So I, I basically added stuff and took out stuff from that presentation and tried to make something a little more uh, visual. And, and I worked at Commodore for a few years. Um, didn't do the kind of stuff that David Pleasance did. It was like in the North American office. I'll go through all that and more. And there's other stuff I did as So I call myself a Commodore kid. Because like, I grew up with the Commodore computers as each model came out. I only did that one for when I was in elementary school, then high school, then college. Um, I'm not this kid. <laughs> I didn't run a commercial, but I looked like that. <laughs> um, my bedroom looked like this. So I had a Commodore, the 1541. The monitors were kind of expensive back then. Yeah. You got a TV. So, you use a TV. Yep. Got my quick shot. I think there's one over Ooh. there. Um, now, I grew up in Commodore's backyard. And I didn't really know that. I thought all the computer companies were far away somewhere else. But like this is Philadelphia, there's Westchester, which is about 45 minutes that way. And I lived right here, which is only a half hour away from Commodore. I didn't, didn't even know that until later. Oh no, I'm still over here. I just want to turn the sound down. Commodore 64 didn't last very long. Um, I used to play around with the connections on the user port. Well, I this stuff and they shorted it out. And they're like, well, we don't have that model, but we have another thing. It says Commodore on the box. We'll just give you that. It was a 128. It's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I got the 128. Free upgrade. We got the uh, Epson printer, which if, if you try to run that today, you probably need like a noise permit to run it. <laughs> uh, same TV, same, same floppy. Um, and then I upgraded again in college to the Amiga. Now that one would have been way out of my price range, but by that time I figured out how to work at Commodore and get to the company store where you get stuff at cost. So it was a, affordable <laughs> for me. <clears throat> at Penn State University, being also you know, within driving distance of Commodore, I guess they had some relationship there. Um, they donated about 25 Amigas to the engineering school. Um, but it would be nice if they had donated them to maybe the School of Visual Arts or video or film or something. But the engineering got them. And they didn't really know what to do with them. So they had an artist in residence and some students. And we kind of took over and we taught the class with all these Amigas over there. Um, let's see, do I have it? Yeah, I got a video here. They produced a video about this thing. So like the first time I saw that many Amigas in one place, I start the video. I'll just run a little, a little bit over here. Because you'll see some of the shots of the room, the classroom. We had one 500, <laughs> but they're all <laughs> so we made like 3D animations, mm. deep paint, a lot of deep paint stuff. It was offered as like an elective class so that anybody in the college could take it, anyone in the university. So we had people from engineering and um, arts, architecture, anybody who could take it just to fulfill an elective requirement. Did you view? Did it ever help? painful it was to try to build and animate stuff back then. Mm. These computers, like of the 25, 20 of them were plain 2000s. So to render 3D animation, you would have to tie up a computer for a week. You know, put a little note oh. on the screen and say, don't touch this. <laughs> there might, you might actually see that on one of the computers, a little piece of paper taped to the monitor saying, I'm rendering. <laughs> now you just put it in the cloud. <laughs> yeah, now you can get a render farm in the cloud. Oh. Anyway, um, then a project came across our table, I guess, um, to participate in a, uh, it was like a contest activity related to the 500th anniversary of Columbus's voyage. Mm -hmm. So they, it was like JTL and a bunch of other universities were designing um, spacecraft powered by, powered by solar wind, so solar sails. Mm -hmm. And we got, Pointed to do the animation for the video. So we were on CNN. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
computer animation from Penn State University. So we do stuff in D paint. That's still much paint. The 3D Why? stuff was done in what does imagine? Designs called for space sales that would unfurl up to a mile wide. I think we had a 24 bit graphic card to render some of those still images. Which entries from several nations. And then we single frame recorded a lot of stuff too. Using uh -huh. a frame control. It's for 1992. Oh. 500th anniversary of Columbus's famous sailing voyage in the New World. There you go. <laughs> that is one of our renderings there. And then we, we also used um, Skull 4D. We didn't use Lightweight because it was, at that time, it was tied to the toaster. We didn't have 30 toasters. We had 30 Amigas. So we, uh, we uh, kind of used software that we could uh, install without having to have uh, the extra hardware. Um, but I, as I mentioned, I worked for Commodore. Um, as a temporary employee on the local bulletin board, so dialing up to BBS in our area in Philadelphia, I found this and printed out my Epson printer. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, job openings in the, uh, they call it uh, Amiga Technical Application. Well, it's, uh, where is it? Yeah, Commodore Amiga Technical Support. No, we. Yes, yes. yes. Cats, it was the department, though. Yeah, I think it says it up there. So there were a couple of positions open, and I didn't think I would get it because I wasn't even out of school yet, I didn't know anything yet, and it worked. <laughs> so I, I, that was my foot in the door, and from that point forward, I was going there every like spring break, winter break, Thanksgiving, they go, okay, we have you, here, do this, go in the reference manual, we're doing a new version, and create a diagram. You know, we'll, give you, we'll draw it out on paper, you mock it up in whatever <laughs> main program. Um, do graphics for trade shows, um, demos for customers, things like that. That eventually translated, when I went back to school, Commodore had an educational student thing. So I joined that. And then after that, I helped. I was, they had a, a job called like a technical support sales engineer. So you'd be paired with a salesperson. And when they went to go visit a client, you'd you know, take some of their stuff and say, oh, here's what you could do with the Commodore computer. Uh, oh, yeah, this is funny. So while working on the other manual, um, the previous um, version of it had a funny Easter egg from one of the engineers. Mm -hmm. No one ever reads this stuff, right? <laughs> but if you zoom in, there's a funny line here. It says, read yeah. it, legal voice will turn your brain to guacamole. You put that in there just to see if anyone <laughs> would notice it. <laughs> That's great. Here's some stuff I did in Lightwave. Um, either yeah. for trade shows or just for fun. There was, there was, there were different marketing efforts within Commodore. There was the consumer division, which well, you know, we all know and understand what, what they did. Um, there was also like a, a, like a professional video division. And these guys, they created um, material that was based on testimonials from actual professionals, because like they figured the most reliable voice you'd want to hear is someone that's in your industry, you know, another musician or artist or video person. So they made this literature and accompanying videos of uh, people that worked on stuff using Commodores. Um, they did an attractive here that they needed a lot of filler, so all the stuff we did in the, in the student lab at Penn State, we said, oh, here, have some of this. <laughs> so some of these animations are, are ours, some of them were from other sources. Like, uh, let's see, our student projects and drawing. Mm. sailing, I guess we didn't have the time to frame record it, because the frame recording, you're basically recording one frame at a time on a videotape, and it, it records it, and then it rewinds and records the next frame, and when it plays back, it's perfectly smooth, but a lot of stuff in that laser disc were done live off the computer, so they weren't like 30 frames a second, they were as good as the computer could play at the time. Um, another project I did was um, Hospital Wayfinder, I did it in Amiga Vision, so this had like, you know, hundreds like of locations within the hospital to search for and find, and I had to program them all in there. <laughs> Hospitals are already complicated places, you know, because they're not usually logically thought out. They, they build one building and they extend it you know, this way or that way, and then the, they had a thing where like you're on the second floor and you go through like an archway, and now you're on the third floor. You didn't actually go up or down. You're just, it's the third floor of the next building over. Um, that was kind of fun. 
parking stuff and searching for, uh, you can search by uh, department or faculty member. Um, another thing I did after Penn State as part of um, a group of shareholders who tried to help steer Commodore in the right direction. You know, we weren't, you know, we were all young kids who just, think we knew what could be done. We didn't know the business side of it yet. And we thought, well, if we just kind of try to talk some sense into the powers that be, maybe they will trust people that are more savvy about the market. And um, we went to the Bahamas because Commodore, they were managed out of, um, what was it, was it Switzerland or Sweden? Switzerland. But then the, the corporate headquarters were officially held in, in the Bahamas. And that was partly to make it difficult for shareholders to show up there. But a bunch of us showed up one year. We tried to, to teach them something. I even you know, had to get shares. You, in order to get in the door, you had to buy stock. So I bought like 200 shares at whatever it was at the time. <laughs> um, but, uh, as you know, it didn't work out. <laughs> we tried. Um, so a lot of people from Commodore Got, we drifted off to, to other companies that were related to Commodore. One of them was Scala. Uh, a lot of the software development for the OS of, of Commodore, those guys, and some of the hardware guys ended up at, at Scala. So for a brief period of time, we had guys like Dave Haney and Randall Jessup, and software guys like Peter Cherna. They were all at Scala. And <laughs> it was kind of neat to be with the same team, only doing you know, slightly different things. Um, but this was at a time where you know Commodore had Gone, it was beginning to go bankrupt. Amigas were becoming hard to find, and you know, Scala was trying to get more market share on a platform that was disappearing. Mm -hmm. and so we had to rush and come up with the Windows platform. Um, uh -oh, it's gonna... So now it runs on Ubuntu, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's working. Uh, so one of the things you see here, there's a video wall that we had to set up every trade show. It doesn't look that big now, but it was pretty big, and those were all CRTs, so they each weighed, you know, 100 pounds or so. We had to set them up every year. <laughs> it was a real fun challenge. Um, one of the things we did, you know, even though we still, we still, we still had our own Amiga stuff, so we used that as much as we could. And Scala developed um, modules to control different pieces of hardware. So you know, it, it had networking ability. It had um, um, control over devices like laser displayers, VCRs. It was used by cable TV stations to do uh, in advertising in the background, like on channels that were not having any content at night or something like that. So I had this demo I created using, uh, it, had a, it had a personal animation recorder, the Studio 16, and a super gen. And so it would give, it was able to play you know, 16-bit audio and then fade back and forth between you know, Amiga graphics and PAR animation. And at one point, we, I used this at a show, and it was like a, one of those things where different companies came up and showed their things. And the one after me, who I think might have been Silicon Graphics, and he just gave us a dirty look. Like, that's not real. You can't do that. <laughs> it's right here. It's, there's no thing on the table. There's no VCR. It really played off that computer. <laughs> But just here's the opening of that one. It's quiet at first. <laughs> and this is captured recently off of a VHS tape. That's the only living copy I have of it. Mm. <laughs> So it's like 3D animation done on the personal animation recorder, fading back to Scala graphics or Amiga graphics, and then back to video again. I mean, this is at a time when, if there was video on other computers, it was usually, you know, uh, like probably 160 by 120 for mm. time. SIP resolution, quarter <laughs> SIP. <laughs> Here we are showing a you know, broadcast 30 frame per second interlaced video. video. And that was all coming from the, the from the video corner or from the video out? Yeah, so it was like um, personal animation recorder was going into the input of the Super Gen, then the Super Gen also had the 
Amiga output, of course, and then they did with the scholars who joined that which one was visible or not, or keying one over the other. We could have cheated and just put it all on the par, but the par only had so much storage on it anyway, so we get so many clips on it that we played and the rest of it was all the graphics. There, with the live video and the video graphics on top. And just cut right to the images. It was really fast and fluid. And at that time, Scala had a timing mode, so you, you could run it in what they called relative time, where each thing had its own time. Like it slides up for five seconds, this one's up for ten seconds, you know, on and on. Or you could do what they did here, where they called it absolute time. So instead of each one having a, its own separate duration, it had a total time. So you, this was at 10 seconds, and then this was at 12 seconds, which meant two seconds later. A lot of the stuff in here uh, we didn't do. We got it from our partners. They were really enthusiastic supporters, and they would come with us to trade shows and give us stuff like videos of either their work or them using software to do their work. <laughs> There's a company, Media Innovations. They were in Toronto. Um, another one called Telecine, they were in Quebec. And then back then, Scala was probably the top program for doing like photo classified channels on cable TV. Was, you know, cable stations would, could make a lot of revenue with just a sales rep, a graphics person, maybe like a business manager and they could go and sell ads to local car dealerships, real estate, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And the hotels, obviously, a lot of hotels always had like the, ch the hotel channel, which told you like mm -hmm. what the hours for the pool are, you know, the specials at the bar, stuff like that. So lightweight animation. I like this one. I did this one for the world of Commodore. Yeah. Commodore shaped spaceship. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. And this was for GBP to promote their products at another trade show, the EGS, the EGS graphics card. And then what presentation wouldn't be complete without lens flare? <laughs> <laughs> you got to have lens flare. Lens it's flare. <laughs> All right. Um, OK, let me go play some that. Another thing I ran into, so doing work at Scala meant we, we, started, we did a lot of different things. The company was really small when we joined, and so you wore a lot of hats. You know, you'd be your own IT department, your own whatever, travel arrangement person. Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna pause this. A little pause. There, perfect. Um, so we get tech support calls, and they range from really cool people doing interesting things, like the one I was about to show you, um, to you know, someone saying they're having trouble. Uh, every time they move the mouse, it moves the opposite direction. And then I'm not sure why. Like, oh, wait, what do you do? Wh wh which way is the cable facing? Well, the cable was getting in my way, so I just ran it the other way down the table. So it's now facing up, upside down. <laughs> uh, but then we got a call from a guy. He's like, I'm on the set of a movie, and I draw storyboards for the special effects so that they can, the actors can see what it will look like when they're doing their scene. But I do it in real, in real time. The director shows me how he's going to shoot the scene, and then I draw it, I sketch it out really quick to show them, and I store it in a Scala presentation, and then we take it to the effects team and say, here's what we told the actors they were looking at. And he was an animator, so he had worked on um, uh, Roger Rabbit and Five Will Goes West and a few other ones like that. Um, and it turned out, I found through the miracles of YouTube and documentaries on YouTube, he was like a big beta tester of deluxe paint, uh, full leveling. Hmm. Um, and he produced his own animations on his own, with his own equipment. And I think we had it, he might have had um, one Amiga with DCTV, Genlock, to another one with D-Paint. As you can tell, like, this background looks very high color mode, like very rich color, but then the foreground objects are more flat, like cartoony. So I think that's how he had produced it that way. So yeah, I've got just a little clip of it, because it's, it's a movie. And for this, he got, um, I do recognize the voice, it's Peter O'Toole. What? what? <laughs> wow. Peter O'Toole. And uh, Dan Haggerty and a couple of famous people did the voices for his, uh, <laughs> he animated it all himself. Hmm. Wow. wow. That's quite an achievement. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so that brings us to the present day. And over there, I have my 1200. And um, I've had that 1200 for a while. I should have brought the 
sales assistant, when the 1200 was announced, there weren't any 1200s. You know, you heard, like David said, like everything was tied up in warehouses in the Philippines, and the, we weren't paying our bills, so they were locked out. So I had one of the few 1200s that there was allowed in the US, and we used it as a sales tool. We went on a road trip from um, Philadelphia to Penn State to Erie, and then across New York to New York City, and then back down again all in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> so that 1200, I've got, I've been itching to upgrade it over the years. And you know, I, th I thought I'll you know, buy something and maybe I'll put it in and it's, it'll sit on the shelf for a year. And then you know, the pandemic happens where you have, like, no free, you have a lot of free time. <laughs> and you're just like browsing the web or you're looking on Facebook, oh, there's someone who put an accelerator that just came out. Oh, there's another thing. And pretty soon I'm ordering more things. <laughs> so, um, Connection. So this is my 1200 from last class. Mm. You know, it's all beige glory here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not much going on. I had a GVP accelerator, the GVP 1230 turbo, and okay. a SCSI adapter on it. That was about it. <laughs> um, so then I got this. <laughs> Mm. It got a facelift on the outside. I, I wish I could get a keyboard, but those those were available for a while, and I didn't take the chance, and now they're not available. So maybe they'll, someone will decide to make them again. Um, so let's flip open the hood. Uh, there's a lot of new stuff in here. You can see it's been uh, uh, recapped by Paul Resendez, who not only, he went, he looked at it twice. One, first time he recapped it, and the second time he took out the um, RF modulator, because what am I going to use that for? <laughs> I made room for other stuff. Uh, so I've got the, the Turbofire 1260 uh, with a, it's a Rev 5 060. So in all these versions of the 060, the first version was the most common. Um, two and three are out there in large quantities, and then five and six are very rare. Hmm. And six is like the ultimate one because it was like the point where they optimized the production and got it to a smaller um, die size. So it, generated less heat and used mm. use less power, but five is good. <laughs> five is good for me. Uh, moving over here, I've got my ROMs. I have the 3.2, but when I put in the 3.2s, I noticed Scala stopped working. Oh. Oh. So I can't use my computer without Scala, so I have to go back to 3.14 until 3.2 gets fixed, which I, I hear there's a 3.2.1 coming. Um, you need to fix Scala. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone has the code. You have the Probably source? <laughs> Kind of tucked in here is my uh, real-time clock, so you can boot up and see 2021 on my workbench. <laughs> uh, let's zoom over this way. Got the uh, Indivision um, MKCR2 or MK2CR. That's it. Yeah, the second one. Um, it does a great job. It came with a cable that went out to a DVI connector. I swapped that for a HDMI where the RF modulator used to be, so now I can get clean, solid art, HDMI, and what's cool about it is like it doesn't have any of the visual artifacts of the normal RGB output. You know, the RGB output gets RF interference, you get bars or bands, you get interlaced flicker. This is, you know, pretty much just taking the pixels and putting them on the screen. Um, is that all the inside stuff? No. Okay, then also got a compact flash. Now those, you know, you can either leave them inside on the motherboard or just run the cable out to the side like I've done for, for a year or two. But uh, Amiga Kit sells a little bracket attachment that slides right where the expansion port is here. And since I don't have anything else there, um, that's where I put it. So that way I can keep the case closed and just slide in a card when I boot up and uh, not have to take it, open up the whole computer just to change the card. Although I did accidentally, there's a little gap here above the um, insertion point. Oh gosh. So I, after putting it all together and I put the floppy drive in, which a floppy drive is a drive that used to be um, an internal drive on a 4000, so it's a high, de the high density version. It didn't fit in the 1200, so I had to kind of bend the metal to fit in there. But yeah, once I done, I'll put it all together, screwed it together, the card went right in here and just right, right to here. Oh, right, right. So I had to like 
open up my computer and shake out the card. <laughs> Those are what opened up all the way. Uh, and then on the outside, I've got a super gen uh, with the RGB converter. That's hard to get. Mm. But the RGB, so the RGB converter, and, and, oh, I, I should have put um, DCTV. So the DCTV is this cool thing that lets you display like what would look like a ham picture, you know, high, high color image, but only use the, the 16 color mode in the, on the computer. So it uses less memory and less CPU to do anything to animate it. Um, and then it, it does some magic on the video signal to make it show the colors. Hmm. Um, but because that's happening outside of the computer um, in the box, DC TV has its own composite video out. So that you have to have two monitors basically, one for your Amiga stuff and one for the DC TV. But they built this uh, RGB converter that um, takes the same signal and feeds it back through the SuperGen. So you can get both the DC TV graphics and the Amiga graphics as if they were all just the same thing. It, it, it looks seamless. It's a little, you know, softer. It's not as sharp, but it's full color. It's, you know, it's a 24-bit color palette. And then I also ordered, um, at the advice of a couple of people, just uh, new power supplies. You know, those tend to not last much longer than the computer, I guess. Mine still work, but I, I just to be safe, I got a new one. It's one of those uh, black ones, and, and I got one for my 128 as well. That's so I figure, um, like maybe tomorrow I could do like a demo of doing graphics in deep paint, Scala, mm. Lightwave maybe. Mm. I use all those tools all the time. At some point I was using Lightwave the way some people would use deep paint. You know, <laughs> so I need to like layer a logo on top of a photo. Well, I'll do it in Lightwave. <laughs> Even though I could just do that in deep paint in five minutes, I'd rather render. You know, you can control lighting. And... Yeah. No, I Are thought you... to do something like that. I never. Uh... Bit for real, but I thought to use like with in the same way that people right now use After Effects with a 3D, you know? Yeah, yeah, I did that too. <laughs> 3 composite thing from today. Yeah, when you, the, the only with with light wave, you know, you have, I guess you have to play around with the lens depth so that things don't get perspective too much when you're mm -hmm. layering, you know, mm -hmm. trying, for trying to imitate After Effects. I think I've even seen someone who did um, like composite animation using. Uh, Art department and A Rex, because huh. hmm. that's you know art department's all scriptable, everything in it. So you could basically write a program to automate you know rendering multiple images over time. But one other cool device I had, I should have brought it with me. Um, or not the device, but I have a piece of a rem remnant of it. It was a optical media disc recorder. Anyone ever hear of these? So it's it's a writable laser disc, but it's only about. I don't know what that is that, like eight, eight or ten inches? Duh. Or a foot, maybe? Yeah. And the device was about this big by this high. Uh, I'm a big toaster oven. They were very expensive, wasn't it? It was like about multi-thousand dollar thing. I, I don't know. It was donated to oh, our, our lab. To our I remember lab. having one of those at a lab. And it, it basically had a video in and could record one frame at a time, yeah, I believe. Yeah. So, Who and you it work, so you could serial control it and say, record this, record this. Yeah, it was the same one. Right. right. Who manufactured that? Uh, there was Panasonic. Huh. I forget that. I think it was at the World of Commodore. It was like this They had a unit there that they were doing. Wow. I remember that there. A big, humongous thing. Yeah, it was big. Right? Uh, yeah. Was it in a caddy? A gigantic caddy? Or was it just no, the discs were, were, it looked like a laser disc. It was like a small laser yeah. disc. Small and laser disc. Steve is the laser disc expert. You should know about that. Yeah. I don't have one of those, but yeah, I got a lot of laser discs. <laughs> <laughs> We did a lot of stuff with LaserDisc where um, we were, at Scala, we were hired to prototype TV program guides of the future. You know, see all the satellite and cable companies wanted to show off at trade shows what it was going to be like when eventually your set top box had a reasonable processor and graphics. So we did it all on either Scala, sometimes we used CanDo, because CanDo had a lot more uh, programmability with buttons and things. So uh, we'd use the LaserDisc, we would record every track on LaserDisc would be a different channel. And then, so when you're flipping channels, you're actually just going to different tracks. It looks like you're watching different channels. So that way, we can control the experience and have different pre-made videos on every channel. That was kind That's of cool. Nice. Any other questions? Questions? Anybody? Oh, we. Yeah, we I, mean, I can tell you more stories. <laughs> stories? Yeah. Like, um, I, I think when I joined 
Commodore, it was like right as 1.3 was going to ship. Okay. So they were beta testing it, and every couple months they'd have a uh, conference room packing party, order some pizzas and stuff with uh -huh. discs to send out to developers. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think a little bit later, it's when they brought in the, the executive from Apple, who was going to you know, bring all the new marketing you know, power that he had at Apple to Commodore. But he had Apple budgets at Commodore. <laughs> so, you know, like they, they said, we have, you know, $10 million in marketing, and here's this commercial that we spent $9.999 million to make. Oh. <laughs> you know? oh. So, we're, I'm thinking, like, how are you going to run that commercial? Where, do you, where are you going to pay to play that? That was the one with the kid, where all the celebrities came to visit the kid uh -huh. at his home. That's where all that went. The budget mm. for that. And then, well, how do you, what are you going to do with that video now you've made it? <laughs> yeah. But luckily, I mean, I think the, the commercial, the professional video that that I helped with, um, that probably helped uh, Commodore a lot in the uh, in those markets because it was more. It wasn't um, hype. It was like, you know, here's what we do. Here's what we do for a living, and here's how we do it. It was nice to be a part of that one. Questions, anybody? Oh, yeah. Well, I remember sometime they were like uh, promoting like a scripting language for Scala. First was called Lingo, then I think Macromedia or whoever was the yeah, director. I forget the name and it was Lingo, but I never seen it used. Hmm. Well, then we just changed it. It was Lingua for a while uh, until Macromedia came out, uh, so we changed it to Scala script. But on the, on the Amiga, the Scala language, it was an interesting language where you would, it wasn't like basic where you'd like do this, then do this, then do this. It was like, here's a bunch of things that are going to be on the screen eventually, and here's what they're going to do. Now make them appear. Like the, the making them appear wasn't in, implied in when you said, you know, draw a box. You just said, here's a box. And then another command would say, okay, now here's the page that has the box. So it was very forward thinking in terms of being like object oriented. Um, what was cool about that is that um, you could write stuff in AREX and build pages on the fly. So you could like write a program to build a Scala script that wouldn't actually be anywhere. Like it was, there, there was no, at the end there was no script. It was like building the background and the page in real time and just saying, put this on the screen. So you could build, that's how we build like um, prototypes for those cable box companies. You know, they needed stuff like a TV guide or a channel selector. You know, you don't want to, have to author that by hand. You just want it to happen on, on real time and just draw the buttons with the right information at that time to make it dynamic. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Yeah, I think it's still running some airport uh, schedule, no? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. actually, we're, we're doing well. I mean, Scala has evolved so much now. It's not anything like what it used to be technology-wise because um, you know every time a new platform and an operating system or hardware comes out, we have to. You know, take the concept and recreate it on that platform. You can't port the code from Amiga to uh, Windows or Windows to whatever. Um, but you know, we, we're doing a lot of airport stuff, interactive, and ran stores and menu boards. Is what seems to be the big thing. All, you know, over the last few years, all, all the restaurants that had had uh, static menu, menu boards, they want to put digital screens up. Hmm. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. The Commodore Los Angeles Super Show.